It is truly good to see everyone here today. Uh, we come past another holiday as we continue to move forward in time. And uh, I hope it was a good day for everyone here and a, a day of renewing and encouragement as you exchange the love and encouragement that only family can give. Um, maybe a few uh, friendships involved in that exchange, and I would hope for that as well. But uh, good to see you back here on a morning that's uh, kind of cloudy. And uh, I don't know about you, but we ran our air conditioner yesterday. It was so warm. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember having done that before, but I suppose it would be possible from either San Antonio or Hawaii. Uh, I just don't remember the former times. Uh, and, of course, that doesn't mean that we did the run air uh, over there, but uh, glad that you're here this morning. If you've been with us for the last several weeks, we've been looking at a series of lessons from the book of Matthew. Uh, but today I'm going to jump over to Luke. I want to uh, focus in a good deal more on the idea of Bethlehem, that place where Jesus was born. If you were a part of the men's class two Wendy's Wednesdays ago, you saw a videotape of about seven minutes long uh, where a guy who was a Messianic Jew uh, heads an organization over in Israel to uh, extend the gospel of Christ into the lives of those that are not believers in Jesus over there. Anyway, did a video about Bethlehem. It raised some questions for me. And I spent a number of hours trying to dig out some of the answers to those questions, and uh, I was not satisfied with the answers that I'd gotten up to the time that I showed the video to the men, but I went home and did some more research and came up with some answers that I thought that it would be helpful maybe to share with you this morning. Obviously, we're a day after Christmas Day. If we lived in England, we would call this Boxing Day. I lived in England three years as a kid, and I never did figure out what Boxing Day was about unless it was the day when you gathered up all the boxes <laughs> after everybody opened their presents. I never did know exactly what that meant, but uh, happy Boxing Day today. Uh, whatever I just said, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> so we're in Luke chapter 2. I would like to read the first 20 verses of Luke chapter 2. Would you please stand for the reading? Of God's word. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying which 
had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Thank you. Please be seated, and may God's blessing be upon the reading of his word today. The plan for the ages was that decimal point that divides all history into either B.C. or A.D. It had its beginning in the Garden of Eden, that plan. Over time, there would be clear prophecies, but many more foreshadowings of the things of heaven that would take place in the life of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Some have likened that story to the Guadiana River that flows in Spain. For a significant part of its course, the Guadiana flows underground. Then, at intervals of several miles apart, the river surfaces in large ponds, only to disappear underground again until finally it bursts forth in a wide stream seeking its path to the ocean several miles away. Well, that's what the story of Jesus is like. People knew that God was working in history but could not have seen the exact details of it all. Finally, the river surfaced when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This was his entry point into the world of humankind. And while the beginning of the story was by no means clearly known or understood in its own day, there are some observations about Bethlehem that are worth taking note of as we look back to that event this Christmas weekend. So we'd like to look a little bit at the details of Bethlehem. As it happens, Bethlehem is not just the birthplace of David and subsequently the birthplace of Christ, but it has a history in, in the story of Israel. First of all, we see that Rachel's son Benjamin was born just outside of Bethlehem, and it was there that Rachel died. And if you were to go there today, you would see a mosque, a little mosque. In my ancient English dictionary that describes all of this, it's called a willy, W-I-L-Y. Never heard that word before, but if you play Scrabble, you might want to hang on to it. <laughs> <laughs> and so here is Benjamin being born, and Rachel is still alive when he is, is born, and uh, he is presented to his mother, and she calls him son of my sorrow. But after she passed, Jacob renamed him son of my right hand. Well, that was the end of Rachel. But you see, that uh, was about maybe a mile, I don't know, a little ways out from Bethlehem where she died and Jacob set up a pillar there. And the mosque houses the pillar where Rachel died. So you probably have a pretty good idea that's the exact actual place that it happened. It talks about a place just outside of uh, Bethlehem, Matthew 31, verse 15, talking about Rachel weeping at the loss of her children. And it's a reference to the fact that the children of Israel have gone into Babylonian captivity. And that's in Jeremiah 31, 15, which is quoted in Matthew 2, 18. We read it a moment ago in reference to the children slain by Herod. Uh, excuse me, that was Matthew. No, we didn't read it a moment ago because we read from Luke. Uh, the quote says, A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. Now, uh, obviously, you have then Rachel's original historical situation being used as a reference to the captivity of the descendants of Abraham into Babylonian captivity, and Jeremiah's assurance in that passage that 
one day they will come home. And that's the setting of Jeremiah 31, but it's quoted in Matthew chapter 2 to talk about the slaying of all the babies at the hand of Herod, who's trying to make absolutely sure no one who might have a title to the throne could possibly threaten his own family's uh, lineage of the throne. Well, you see, that's the way Scripture works, isn't it? And so here's this place called Bethlehem showing up again and again. Well, it shows up uh, also uh, in the story of Ruth. And Ruth was from Moab. It was uh, Naomi and her husband and two boys that leave Bethlehem and go to Moab where there's more rain and there's crops to be had and food to be eaten. And they stay in Moab long enough for the boys to grow up and marry. But they're still there when Naomi's husband dies and the two boys die. And now there is only the patriarchal mother and these two Moabite uh, daughters-in-law. One stays in Moab, but Naomi takes Ruth and they go back. As you know the story, Ruth volunteers to stay with Naomi and take care of her. So they go back to Bethlehem and Ruth is a total stranger, but she seems to be a godly woman and she is there to make sure that Naomi doesn't starve to death because she's too old to go out and glean grain and so forth. And she finds favor with Boaz and Boaz ends up marrying her as a part of the package deal to buy the land that Naomi owned uh, or Naomi's husband owned, however you want to describe that at any rate. <clears throat> then R Ruth becomes the great-grandmother to King David. And so here's another story, whereas the, this uh, integration, uh, it would seem maybe there's a hint of the idea that the ultimate blessing that would be provided by the lineage of David would reach out to all the Gentiles uh, represented in the fact that uh, Ruth is a Moabitess and not a Jew at any rate. There is that story that uh, provides that background to King David. And then there is the story of King David at Bethlehem, which is my second main point. God tells Samuel as we pick up, to go to Bethlehem and anoint David as the future king. This is in 1 Samuel. And he's concerned about that because he wonders if Saul finds out that, that Samuel's going to anoint another person king who's not of Saul's uh, kinship, Saul might kill him. And probably he had good reason to think that. But God says, you go on and Take a, 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 an offering with you. When you get there, you got this bull, you're going to make this offering, and Saul will not be suspicious. So Samuel goes and he addresses the boys that are there. There are seven sons who simply don't make the cut. And Samuel turns to Jesse and says, Do you have any other boys? Because I don't see the one that uh, I'm supposed to anoint. And he says, well, huh, only David, he's just a kid, you know, and, and he's out keeping the sheep. And so Samuel says, bring him. Which suggests to us that God does not see as man sees. We don't necessarily do things the way we do them if we're going to follow God because God does things differently sometimes. And we need to be in tune with what God would do, prayer will provide you the answer for what God would do. So David comes, he serves in Saul's court for a time, and you know how he kills Goliath and how he kills uh, thousands of Philistines, and he hears the crowd cheering, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands, and that makes Saul jealous, of course, and uh, Saul begins this process of uh, persecution, Toward prosecution, however you might describe it, uh, Saul's out to kill David. And David has to run for his life. He spends several years uh, in living in Philistia. 
uh, trying to avoid the region where Saul's power would end up causing his death. And so we see this story of David unfold as he becomes king and extends the regional power of Israel more broadly than at any other time in the history of Israel. Solomon enjoyed that breadth of the, the region of, of David's influence, but Saul did not go further. This influence went above what we today call Syria, Damascus, beyond there, north of there. There is an incredible swath of land that David takes under his sphere of influence, and it will be true that one day the future Messiah would be called the son of David. Not Solomon, some other son. And the point is to figure out who, isn't it? Well, there's a few other places in the Old Testament where Bethlehem comes up. I'm, point, I'm on point three. Uh, you find Bethlehem, the prophecy about the birthplace of the Messiah coming in Micah 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, that was the earlier name of Ephrathah. It was named after a man named Ephrath. Its earlier name was Ephrathah, and that is incorporated into its later name here. You, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. There's another passage in Micah that is again quoted by this little seven-minute film, that the men saw a couple of Wednesdays ago, Micah 4, 8, that says, And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. And so there's this mention of the tower of the flock. And if you're reading that in English, you don't know what that is or if it's anything at all, but... In, in Hebrew, it shows up with a certain phrase, migdol adair, which interestingly enough provides enough of a background that uh, I'm going to save that for just a minute, but to just say Micah talks about this, this uh, shepherd's tower. Uh, we'll take note of that in a moment. So here's these two passages in Micah and the third in Jeremiah chapter 41, verse 17. The rebels stay. These people who have killed Gedaliah, the puppet throne of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire, he leaves a person in charge of these very few who were left after the captivity has been executed and these people are left. And they go kill the puppet king. And then they go to Jeremiah, who's been left there, and they say, should we stay or should we go to Egypt? And so he consults the Lord for a few days and he comes back and he says, the Lord says you stay and God will bless you. If you go to Egypt, you'll never see the end of trouble the rest of your life. And so they say, thanks for the input. We're going to Egypt and we'll take you with us. And so they go and on the way, they're headed southward and they stay at a little town just outside of Bethlehem where there's evidently some kind of an end. And so uh, this uh, road that includes Bethlehem and so forth is on the way to the Negev, which is that region that goes towards Egypt. And so it's just mentioned in passing that there's an inn. Now, is that the inn that Mary and Joseph asked for a place to stay? Uh, probably not because it wasn't technically Bethlehem. It was another little village whose name was insignificant enough. I didn't type it into my outline. Roman numeral number four deals with Bethlehem and Jesus. We know something of the story. I won't get into parts that you already know, but I want to point out what one writer that I read made the point of saying, and that is that isn't it ironic? In a, in a day of the 1800s and the 1900s where all these liberals want to say, well, this story was made up. It was concocted. And it's not true. If you were a Jew, would you make up a story where Jesus lands in, in Bethlehem only on account of a foreign king, a foreign emperor who goes through his regional uh, 
whatever you call it, governor in Syria, uh, Quirinius, to establish a census. And you know, this would be very distasteful to the Jews. They could have figured out some other way to get Jesus. If they're going to make up a story that's going to be somewhat nationalistic in its bent toward the Jews, wouldn't they want to do that in a way that doesn't insult them? And so it's by an outside force that they deeply resent that this the census takes place. Not only that, but the purpose of the census was just so they could get more taxes out of the Jewish people. And so Joseph has to go. He takes Mary over a 70-mile trip along the precipice of some cliffs and a long way to go. This, this woman is pregnant, riding on a donkey. I can think that maybe a car would be a lot more comfortable than a donkey, but they didn't have cars. And so she rode the best vehicle she could find, and they go this long journey, and they get there. Now everybody's showing up because the descendants of David have to register. So there's no place for them to stay where people normally stay. And so they go to a place that is well recognized through the history of Christianity. It was referred to by Justin Martyr in 140 AD. Justin was just from 40 miles north of there. And the local hearsay, the local story was that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and so forth. And they knew the place. There was a, uh, uh, well, a cave. There's another word, grotto, that it's frequently referred to as, that was well recognized even, uh, or Origen mentions it in, uh, what is it, uh, he lives about 285 AD, and he talks about it, others talk about it, and it's known well enough that Emperor Trajan of the Roman Empire decides to build a temple to Apollo on the site to obscure the location as where Jesus was born. Built some, you know, planted some trees and built a little temple to Apollo, and but that is torn down by Constantine, who became a follower of Christ, and his mother was influential in locating a lot of the sites that were special to Christians. And she wanted to build a little, you know, little, some kind of church building there. And from the days of Constantine, I guess until uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church waned in its influence, it was those uh, Orthodox people who took control of the place. And so there was a, there was a building, building built. It was later, um, maybe part of it torn down, but nevertheless, there is some kind of a Christian structure there since 325 AD. It is the oldest church building known to Christianity where Jesus' birthplace is located. There is that little grotto down underneath. You go down some stairs over in one corner of the place and lower your head and go in there and here's supposed to be the place. You might say, well, how did they know that was exactly the place? What I can tell you is that Eusebius in the fourth century wrote about this Migdol Eder. You say, well, wait a minute. That's what I said a minute ago about Micah 4, 8, this place that uh, Micah is pointing to and you, O tower of the flock, it's a, it's a shepherd's tower, hill of the daughter of Zion. Well, what's going on with that? Well, here were these, these rock-built uh, circular structures that would raise a shepherd up above ground level on a slope where the shepherd could see all the sheep and make sure that they were okay. You remember David was that king who was completely the one responsible for the location of the temple being in Jerusalem. The tabernacle had been in Gideon, up where Saul lived. And so, you know, the main place of worship was where the king was, and that was Gideon. And uh, then uh, David moves the, the uh Ark of the Covenant down to Jerusalem during his lifetime, but God told him, no, you can't build my temple. Too much blood has been shed in your life, but your son Solomon 
can do this. So David saves gold and he saves silver and he gathers everything he can so that when he dies, Solomon can embark upon this building project that takes seven years to construct and he builds this temple. One of the things that you gotta be concerned about if you're gonna worry about a temple is, at all is the fact that the primary function of a temple is the sacrifice of animals and the function of those sacrifices to bring forgiveness of sins. And so David gives the shepherds some of the family property out there on the slopes coming off of Bethlehem by which they can watch these sheep. And there are more of these shepherds' towers on the outskirts of Bethlehem than they are any other place, another uh, I don't know if I want to say geological, but a, a phenomenon of, of the stone. It's limestone, and there are these. If I lived in Hawaii, I would call them pukas, a little washout maybe, uh, but a, a, a dip where you could lay an animal. And so these are called mangers, and they have similar structures down in Hebron. If you were going to take a look and say, so what's that like? Well, go to Hebron, go to Bethlehem, take a look at what the limestone structures look like, and you'll see a nice place to lay some lambs. And so the, the rabbinic tradition tells that it was this process of establishing those well cared for lambs because of the shepherd's towers that the priest getting ready for sacrifices would come to Bethlehem and get a little lamb and lay it in one of these uh, these. I want to say a crutch, but that's not right. Uh, mangers, the, these rock-hewn dips in the rock. And he would inspect the lamb. And if he was certain there were no flaws, he would take that lamb and wrap it in swaddling clothes. Why? To protect it and to help ensure that it can't move freely and jump out of his arms. And he literally carries the lamb in his arms back to Jerusalem to assure that nothing bad can happen to the lamb because if the lamb is flawed, it can't be used for the sacrifice. And so Day of Atonement, whatever else, this process takes place. And so here is this function of assuring God's requirements are met so that sins can be forgiven. And it's important that Jesus is born in Bethlehem not just to fulfill the prophecy about it, not just to show the humility of the place, but to show the function of forgiveness has been met and assured in every possible way. Jesus was laid in a manger, wrapped in the same swaddling clothes, and overlooked by the same shepherds who did the sacrificial stuff with animals. Those were the shepherds that overlooked what happened the night Jesus was born. And so you see all of this coming together. I have wondered why this didn't show up in Christian history. There was a post in Facebook about it that was not the, the, the film, but if you saw my post... I gave the link to the YouTube video as well as to what somebody else wrote about it. And my stuff was more complete than the other. At any rate, <laughs> I want to say this is significant because you see the struggle of struggles that we all have is knowing that we are forgiven. Only you know those things that, that you don't want anybody else to know. But one day you'll face God who knows it all. And you will want to have confidence that indeed you are forgiven. And through our lives, I think it is a struggle because of the shame associated with sin and because of the bondage associated with sin, we struggle to believe that. <clears throat> Well, there's a Christian writer in 450 AD that writes songs. And you wonder, well, what goes on in the mind of a songwriter? He writes because of what he believes. He's moved to the power of his faith 
And he puts down these thoughts that later become songs because they testify to the truth that we embrace. And so here's Anatolius, 450 AD, writing this, a great and mighty wonder, a full and holy cure. The virgin bears the infant with virgin honor pure. The word becomes incarnate and yet remains on high and cherubs sing anthems to shepherds from the sky. And we with them triumphant repeat the hymn again, to God on high be glory and peace on earth to men. While thus they sing your monarch, those bright angelic bands, rejoice ye vales and mountains, ye oceans clap your hands, since all he comes to ransom by all be he adored, the infant born in Bethlehem, the Savior and the Lord, and idle forms shall perish, and error shall decay, and Christ shall wield the scepter, our Lord and God, for a, which means forever. Now, you might say, Dave, that doesn't exactly rock my, rock my socks off. And I would say, well, if you're into poetry, this might not be the best thing for modern ears to hear. But I'll tell you this. What's interesting about it, almost 1,600 years ago, there was a man writing about Jesus' arrival on the earth in terms of a full and holy cure. We struggle for cures, don't we? We take medicine for cures. This last week, I felt a little bit of an ear infection coming on. I put a little hydrogen peroxide in there. It felt better. Next day, it needs it again. Do it again. Next day, do it again. By the third or fourth day, it's getting worse, and I'm adding hydrogen peroxide last day about 10 or 12 times. And by late at night, it's bad enough. I said, well, I, I remember somebody said that essential oils are antibiotic in nature. So I know I have some essential oil somewhere. I went up in the bathroom, I found this little bottle of lemon essential oil, and I put that in my ear. That is the worst thing I have ever done to myself in my whole life. I moaned for the next hour, and I am not exaggerating. That was a bad cure. And I knew then, it's too late for any other options. I've got to go to the doctor and get some antibiotic and I've got to start taking decongestant, both of which are hard on your body, but it was necessary, and I'm still on both, and I can hear you today out of my right ear, which I couldn't have done three days ago. I'm so happy for a cure that is full, but the cure of Jesus is full and holy, and I wonder if someone were to ask you the question, what difference does it make that Jesus came to this world, born in Bethlehem, crucified in Jerusalem, ascended from the Mount of Olives? What difference has it made in your life? What changes would you say are evident in you because Jesus came? Because you see, we celebrate Christmas and we exchange gifts because it's a joyous occasion that provided what? If not forgiveness of sins, if not confidence about life, if not the ability to be in the moment and to hear other people when they try to communicate with you and to draw them out and let them know that somebody cares. If you can say, yes, I know it makes a huge difference in my life, and I worship him every day. And I would say, praise be to God. Amen. Pass the turkey. <laughs> you know, there's some great things that we celebrate because we follow Jesus. But we've got to make sure of this. We take one step past the form of religion and get into the content enough to sit down and spend time with God and get to know him as a friend so that when our day comes where the whole world seems to be imploding, 
we can turn to a friend that we know. The prayers of a righteous man, it says, availeth much, indicating that the prayers of a man less righteous might not avail as much. Wouldn't you like to be that go-to person for your family, for prayer, for your friends, for prayer? Be that person. Spend time with God. Fellowship with Him. Enjoy forgiveness. Believe forgiveness. Repent when you need to. And live with God. Will you come to Him? It's God's invitation as we stand and sing.